I'm interested in aspects of how we you know, do uh, the political part of bioethics, the issues to do with regulatory policy surrounding bioethics, and I'm interested in issues of regulatory policy in general, issues of politics and political philosophy and how they relate. Uh, Tony was waving around the two books. The two books really deal with, with those kind of issues, how we deal with politics generally, what's supposed to be a secular kind of state in modern liberal democracies, and, and more generally how that affects regulatory policy and bioethics, including issues to do with genetic choice and, and, and indeed uh, genetic enhancement, if that really becomes a possibility. That's what I'm all about. That's what this talk is kind of all about. But I'm actually going to speak in particular about what might be the implications if we take the work of American psychologist Jonathan Haidt and his collaborators um, seriously. So this fellow, Jonathan Haidt, it's pronounced. Um, if we're interested in political controversies uh, related to decisions at the beginning and the end of life or related to genetic choice, Haidt's theory of morality's foundational values you know, may, or may not, but may have important implications. Uh, it may likewise have implications for broader issues of how we conduct political de deliberation in our liberal democracies. Um, and in any event, issues to do with bioethical questions may provide illuminating examples of the more general political deliberation process and how I kind of think it should work. In recent years, uh, Jonathan Haidt has achieved prominence as a social psychologist specialising in the scientific study of morality and the emotions and emotional tendencies related to it, and especially in regard to what he regards as the foundational values underlying various moral and political viewpoints. In his 2012 book, The Righteous Mind, he synthesises a lot of his thinking. You know, he's written a lot of articles, sometimes in collaboration with other people, but a lot of it is synthesised in this book. And this is the book I'm really going to be dependent upon. Um, in that volume, he focuses on what he sees as the respective values underlying uh, liberalism, conservatism and libertarianism three political tribes, if you uh, want to look at it that way, in American politics in particular. At an early point in the book, he clarifies what he means by the slippery word uh, liberal, uh, a very pesky word that seems to mean all sorts of things to different people, that he, he says in the United States, the word liberal refers to progressive or left-wing politics. You can see it on the slide. He'll use the word in that sense uh, elsewhere. Uh, it's true to its original meaning, valuing liberty above all else, uh, including in economic activities. Of course, it can mean something different again in Australia where we have a Liberal Party with capital L, which is actually a Conservative Party. Right? So, so it's a very difficult word. But this is what he means uh, by liberal. Uh, I have a little bit of discomfort with that definition and not just because our Liberal Party is the Conservative Party, but because there certainly are plenty of people who are liberal by this definition, who embrace progressive or left-wing politics, but who can be just as authoritarian or anti-liberal or illiberal as anyone else, you know, using my understanding of what um, being a liberal is all about. That is, they do not necessarily uh, embrace such ideas as freedom of speech, individual liberty, and the rule of law. The fact that you're left-wing doesn't mean you necessarily embrace any of those things. Accordingly, in what follows, I will handle the word liberal with care, but this is what Haidt means by it. Similar issues arise with uh, conservative and with libertarian. I mean, often uh, views come from so-called libertarians in the US don't seem to have much to do with you know, views that you might find in you know, classic libertarian thinkers, all these words are contested in what they really mean and what they really amount to. 
I should also say that Haidt's attempts to identify foundational moral values are not without precedent. There's a whole body of social psychology, um, anthropology, literature in the social sciences uh, that deals with this. Haidt himself refers to and is heavily influenced by the pre-existing literature in the field of psychological anthropology. His system is, however, up to date in the fact that you know, he's still around, he's writing it, and it's influential. Uh, and in my view, it's at least somewhat persuasive, at least by implication. I'll have some criticisms of Haidt today, but I think there's a great deal in it that's you know, somewhat persuasive. Note that Haidt is not confining himself to a purely descriptive study of fundamental um, moral values or foundational moral values or of the various values of various societies or cultures or moral and political tribes. It's not a purely descriptive exercise in a book such as The Righteous Mind. He, beyond that descriptive sort of scientific, empirical ambition, he regards his empirical claims as having significance for how we should live our lives, how we should treat each other, and, and they should have significance for government uh, policies that we ought to support and oppose. So in a way you could say he's doing moral and political philosophy as well as doing um, you know, social psychology. As he puts it somewhat in passing in the book, um, and I'll put this up as well, my goal is to change the way a diverse group of readers, liberal and conservative, secular and religious, think about morality, politics, religion, and each other, right? So he has that kind of normative goal. He wants us to change our minds about how we think about certain things and, and how we will act and how we'll treat each other, how we'll interact. That's what he's trying to achieve in The Righteous Minds. Today, I will assume that the moral foundations um, model or theory is approximately true. I said I'll have some implicit criticism of height, but I'll assume it's approximately true. That's partly because I suspect it does actually contain a theme of truth. As I've already said, uh, I find it at least somewhat persuasive. And it's partly because it has obtained enough prominence and prestige for us to want to consider its implications, even if we are inclined to be you know, somewhat sceptical about the whole of it or, or parts of it. So let's just get to Haidt's model. What is he saying? Well, in brief, he identifies six supposed moral foundations or foundational challenges that are addressed by morality. The first five of these are, and I quote him here, it says, caring for vulnerable children, forming partnerships with non-kin to reap the uh, benefits of reciprocity, forming coalitions to compete with other coalitions, negotiating status hierarchies, and keeping oneself and one's kin free of parasites and pathogens, which spread quickly when people live in close proximity to each other. Or that, that quote's on your handout if you want to take it away. Uh, later he adds a sixth, which relates to rebellion against domination. And that gives us the following moral foundations as he, he sees them. Um, Spot the typo on this slide. Yeah, there's always a typo on the slide that you discover after you send it off to the conference organisers. Uh, but the foundations are care slash harm, so a value to disvalue, fairness, cheating, loyalty, betrayal, authority, subversion, sanctity, that should say, uh, degradation, liberty, oppression. Right. So those are the six supposed foundations addressing challenges that morality is there to, to cope with in human groups, according to, to Haidt. In the context of standard American political tribes, um, which are liberals in the relevant sense, conservatives and libertarians, Haidt suggests that liberals rely most on the foundations of care, harm, and liberty, oppression, and to a lesser extent on fairness cheating. Conservatives supposedly place more emphasis on fairness cheating, but they understand fairness in a different way. They see it as about proportionality, about getting rewards in proportion to your, you know, your effort and contribution, rather than an idea, of a more egalitarian idea, say. And they're more willing than liberals to see some get hurt 
in order to achieve other moral objectives. They also understand liberty in a different way, more as the right to be left alone rather than you know, empowering disadvantaged groups or something like, like that, as, as liberals may be inclined to do. Uh, liberals are supposedly ambivalent about the other three foundations, while conservatives put some stress on all of them, though perhaps interpreting some in a different way. Uh, libertarians have little use for most of them. Height defines sanctity, which is what I want to kind of home in on today, as the ability to endow ideas, objects and events with infinite value, particularly those ideas, objects and events that bind a group together to form a single entity. So a group, uh, you know, as Rob Sparrow says, groups are themselves partly the product of moralisation. You know, we have moral tribes to... Um, you know, borrow another well-known psychologist, Joshua Green, who I'll come back to. Tribes who define themselves, in fact, around these values. Um, they, these values, ideas, objects, symbols, events that are valued in certain ways will bind a group together, says Height, um, to form, he says, a, a single entity. And they then infinite value will be placed on some of those things. And a kind of infinite disvalue will be placed on things that are seen to violate them or degrade them or, or pollute them or, or something along those lines. Okay, that's the idea of, of sanctity as it comes up uh, in, in Height's work. He sees this as the concept he introduces with you know, the sanctity foundation that we had a couple of slides back. But he later suggests there are values held by liberals, by conservatives, and by libertarians, respectively, that are associated with others among the six foundations and, and which they hold sacred. Thus, the most sacred value for liberals is, he says, care for victims of oppression. Now, that's the sacred value for liberals. For conservatives, it's preserve the institutions and traditions that sustain a moral community. For libertarians, the most sacred value is supposed to be individual liberty. You know, you know, fairly simple ideas of what these fundamental values are that are held sacred by these political groups. Now, that, that connection uh, between the Sanctity Foundation and these other foundations where there are values connected with them, held sacred, that may create a complication for the model. I'm sure we could tamper with this model, fiddle with it, try to make it more logical, criticise it, etc. But I doubt that any of that is going to be fatal to you know, the most fundamental concepts. I think the model probably does need some more work. It may not be strictly logical. But I'm only assuming for today's purposes that it's approximately correct. And I'm strongly sympathetic to one idea. It's the idea, and I did, I think, could survive much tampering, that various moral and political tribes do attribute a kind of sanctity, a kind of infinite value, to their key moral values and ideas. So let's get to bioethical issues, um, which, as I say, is something I'm especially interested in. How does all this apply to regulatory policy in the area of you know, decisions at the beginning and end of life, for example, or decisions of genetic choice, which are generally going to be choices at the beginning of life, right? Um, it can seem difficult, Height makes this point, it can seem difficult understanding what some of the arguments that go on are even about, and there's at least some participants are relying on concepts to do with sanctity. So, Height comments, I think this is plausible, he says, if you dismiss the sanctity foundation entirely, then it's hard to understand the farce over most of today's biomedical controversies. And he goes on, I, I quote him at uh, greater length on the handout, and just to continue what he says, the, the only ethical question about abortion becomes at what point can a fetus feel pain? Um, Doctor-assisted suicide becomes an obviously good thing. You know, people who are suffering should be allowed to end their lives, uh, should be given medical help to do it painlessly. Same for stem cell research. Why not take tissue from all those embryos living in suspended animation and fertility clinics? They can't feel pain, uh, but their tissues could help researchers develop cures that could spare sentient people from pain. Um, quote from 
the Righteous Mind, page 152. So you might say, if you're, if you're looking at these bioethical issues, you know, from a point of view that doesn't rely on concepts of sanctity in any way, you're looking at, for example, early embryos as just little bits of protoplasm, um, taking into account what can or cannot feel pain, what's the issue with a lot of these questions? And to put this in larger perspective, you know, the, the overarching topic of today's symposium you know, has to do with destiny or disaster. But what's going to be the disaster from some of these choices? You know, it's difficult to see how biomedical choices could lead us to disaster, at least on the scale of you know, massive environmental risks from degradation of the environment and you know, climate change or how they can have the kind of disastrous impact of massively destructive weapons in the hands of ideological, you know, apocalyptic um, fanatics, or how they can have the same disastrous impact as a hammer blow from space, like the boloid that you know, brought to an end the non-avian dinosaurs about 66 million years ago. It's hard to see how bioethical choices to abort a fetus or you know, to allow a regime where physician-assisted suicide is available, where's the disaster from a purely secular point of view? From the point of view that does not place any kind of infinite weight on, say, um, biological human life. If it's disaster we're worried about, anything to do with biomedical choices at the beginning and end of life should come a pretty long way down our list of priorities, I would suggest. Yeah, there's no reason to believe that any catastrophic change any, let alone any catastrophic global risk, arrives from giving abortion rights, reproductive rights to women, or by carrying out embryonic stem cell research, or by allowing a broad right to efficient-assisted suicide, or by permitting human reproductive cloning, or even by permitting some kind of genetic engineering of human embryos for therapeutic or enhancement purposes. You know, where is the disaster from a a point of view that does not have some kind of role for the sanctity foundation or something like it. It appears to me that much of the heat in bioethical controversies comes from the fact that at least some of the participants are relying upon already moralised conceptions of what would be disastrous. So from involvement in bioethical debates over the past 15 years or so now, I've learnt that what at least some conservative bioethicists are worried about are not risks to the planet or the environment. Uh, they're arguing about spiritual or metaphysical risks or dangers. Risks to the human spirit, as Margaret Somerville puts it, or, or to the natural order, or something else that they hold sacred. Such risks may be explained or rationalised in various ways. You know, they can be understood perhaps in terms of an infinite uh, value on biologically human life or on the idea that you know, we have divine souls implanted in our bodies and that these must not be defiled or destroyed or their creator dishonoured. Or the idea of an inviolable natural order of things perhaps established by God, something that I do actually talk about a fair bit in the book, Humanity Enhanced. Now, an obvious difficulty with this way of thinking, thinking about these spiritual or metaphysical dangers or risks, is that we can't easily justify belief in divine souls or an inviolable order of nature or the sanctity of biological human life. And even if some apparently reasonable people do believe in some of those things, such as, for example, divine souls implanted at the moment of conception, that's a highly controversial spiritual belief. And I would claim, and I argue for this at length in um, Freedom of Religion and the Secular State, that's a poor basis. Any belief like that is a poor basis for public policy or, for, or even for a commonly shared morality that, you know, among citizens of our modern um, pluralistic societies who come from many spiritual, cultural and philosophical traditions. Now, Hyatt himself does not claim that anything really possesses the kind of infinite or extreme value that he associates with sanctity. I mean, he's not putting that argument that you might hear from someone like Margaret Somerville, 
who does think that human cloning is a threat to the human spirit, right? She, she says that, and she, she's argued that with me. Um, Height's not saying something like that, but he writes of the power of attributed sanctity to invest objects with irrational and extreme values, both positive and negative, which are important for binding groups together. Now note here, you know, he uses the word irrational. He's not saying that this is something that can be rationally justified. Um, but he seems to be onto something in any event. I think that that something is maybe a little bit different from what he is explaining it as. In my terms, that something is the power of our moral imaginations to, to project a kind of overlay, investing ideas and objects, events, symbols, beliefs, actions, political causes, etc., with superlative value or superlative disvalue, where something that's superlatively valued is being, you know, dishonoured, polluted, violated, etc., etc. Our moral imaginations create that kind of overlay. And there's a disconnect between the overlay that our moral imaginations create and the cold reality. Um, that disconnect might not matter so much for practical purposes if we lived in culturally closed societies where everybody agreed, where values were widely shared and alternatives were almost unthinkable, if there have ever been totally culturally closed societies like that. But that's, in any event, the opposite of our actual situation, as Joshua Green emphasises through his recent book, Moral Tribes. Modern Western societies blend you know, different groups with complex, diverse, yet intertwined um, histories and traditions. You know, day by day, those tribes confront each other in political and cultural debate, relying upon rival moral systems that they respectively see as authoritative and brandishing rival symbols and often struggling for political supremacy, struggling for power. What one tribe sees as uh, sacred may be seen by another as degraded, demonic, malign, polluting, you know, literally blasphemous or symbolically, you know, effectively uh, blasphemous by a, a rival tribe. That's the situation that we actually face. And if the rival moral and political tribes insist on the imposition of their respective sacred values as they project them, they want those imposed through public policy and the law, this is a recipe for escalating social conflict rather than for binding and harmony. It may create binding within the tribe, but it's not going to create harmony within a larger society where more than one moral tribe is reflected. And, and, I, and I'll, I'll come back to that problem. I, I'm going to say a little bit about bioethics, and the bit I'm going to skip over is some stuff about Philip Kitcher's view on, on, on some bioethical issues in his book, The Ethical Project. Uh, you'll, you'll have to get more of, of this on, on Monday if you do make it to Sydney. But one entry point to the discussion of sanctity in bioethical regulatory policy um, comes up in Philip Kitcher's discussion in that book of several issues relating to genetic technology. Um, Kitcher, as some of you will know, advocates a moral theory that he terms pragmatic naturalism. The general idea is that our remote ancestors invented morality uh, to meet the needs of social living. Morality is, in effect, a kind of social technology to address the difficulties experienced within human groups. And, and look, I roughly agree with that. I think that's fine so far. My problem is how much can you really deduce from something as broad as that? Uh, well, we could focus in on what... Um, Kitcher says about various issues, I say I'll skip over that, but one point that he makes in his more general discussion of advanced reproductive and genetic technology leads him to suggest that we do explore ideas of worth or sacredness of early human life in order to discourage eugenic thinking and callous attitudes to disabled children. Um, and that would include, for example, not using merely biological te terminology when we discuss early embryos, but rather employing language that seems to assign some kind of moral worth or inherent value or in something like sacredness. Yeah, picture, it's maybe we should use this kind of language. Now, I suppose it's possible that if we made that conscious decision, it could produce pragmatic social benefits, which is what Pitcher wants. But it appears more obvious to me that it would tend to undermine our commitment to intellectual honesty. Furthermore, 
that might well produce harms to individuals. People who experience the use of that kind of sacred language as dishonest and as contrary to their own self-conceptions and values could find themselves punished formally or otherwise for not using that language. If that became a, you know, a shared morality, a shared moral norm, that we will decide to use that language. Um, and a social practice of insisting on that kind of emotionally and metaphysically charged language could harm individuals and couples if it tended to hinder their ability to act on their own values without directly hurting anyone. So I would resist any kind of policy decision. You know, from now on, we will use this kind of language of sanctity and inherent moral worth when we talk about, for example, early embryos. I think that can produce harm, it can cut across our ideas of intellectual honesty, we can cut across ideas of ourselves. And I doubt that there's anything in this broader theory of pragmatic naturalism which requires us to use that language. I think Kitscher actually makes a mistake in thinking that pragmatic naturalism can deliver more thick morality, detailed morality, than it actually can. I would concede to Kitscher that not just anything can be a moral system, you know, there are going to be limits, uh, not just any arbitrary set of rules, it's going to work as a moral system. But you need a lot more than pragmatic naturalism to come up with a specific moral system that everybody can accept. So I'm unlikely to agree to any policy that involves pretending that some things possess sanctity, uh, when I don't think they do. Um, pretend perhaps on basis of some religious or metaphysical uh, rationalisation. And I say, I submit to you that bioethical regulatory argument, bioethical debates generally can go on without any such pretense. We, we can discuss, for example, whether a particularly a particular regulatory regime will adequately reduce the risks to individuals if we permit physician-assisted suicide. Now we can discuss specific regimes, we can balance important but finite values relating to the risks that, you know, grandma will be pressured into, you know, it's time to go now, against, you know, people being in terrible situations and, and needing choices in those situations. We can discuss that, you know, in a way that involves, you know, weighing up finite, uh, worldly risks and harms and benefits. Again, we can do our best to assess the risks that some very powerful genetic and other technologies uh, will eventually become available in an unequal world, leading to greater and more entrenched you know, socioeconomic inequality. So we can try to weigh that up and work that out. We can weigh those sorts of risks. It's doubtful, though, that any of that would lead to the kind of emotionally charged moralistic rejection of new procedures and new technologies that we often hear, or that it would support any you know, sweeping legal prohibitions. Um, up to a point, Height might agree with that. He thinks that we should use utilitarianism as our, our public morality for public policy, uh, though we, we have some caveats on that. Uh, I don't want to go into the detail of that, but what I would propose is something much less, and that is simply that we use well-known liberal principles in our public deliberations. And I don't mean liberal uh, in the popular sense of left-wing or progressive. I actually do want to gesture at liberal in my sense. Um, liberals in my sense are people who value secular government, individual liberty, freedom of speech and the rule of law, oppose authoritarianism and arbitrary government power, and at least tolerate or sometimes even welcome experiments in living and diverse conceptions of the good. Right? I think those sorts of principles should govern our our political deliberations. Uh, that said, I think height might well be correct to see a rise in the US and perhaps more broadly in Western democracies of what he calls a Manichaeanism in politics. In the resulting um, environment, ideological purity is demanded, compromise is viewed as a sin, and the result is a poisoned political atmosphere, says height. I think that rings true. I, I, I see what I consider evidence of that every day. Um, so, do we need sanctity in bioethics or politics? Well, I say not, but what happens when we face this kind of Manichaean situation where one moral and political tribe holds sacred what's seen by another Too tribe much. as degraded, demonic, malign, blasphemous, polluting, and, and so on? Uh, Height is partly addressing his own original political tribe, American liberals, 
people committed to left-wing or progressive politics, he wants them to abandon the mindset that conservatives are motivated by, you know, um, bad childhood, ugly personality traits and so on. And he says, well, start by assuming conservatives are just as sincere as liberals and then use the moral foundation theory to understand the moral matrices of both sides. I do think there's a tendency to see our political opponents as civilizational enemies or uh, as just plain evildoers. And while that might apply to some people, such as outright neo-Nazis, I think we do need to step back and stop looking at our political opponents in that way. But none of that implies that in doing so, we should be accepting placing weight on these ideas of sanctity in public policy. So some take home points in my last minute. Um, informed bioethics and political discussion can go on, I say, without a concept of sanctity. Um, liberal democracies need to resolve issues of policy, including bioethical issues, without appealing to sacred values. But there is a Manichaeanism in cultural and political debate, I think. I think Hype is correct about that. And I think he's correct that you know, morality binds and blinds. It can bind us together into ideological teams and it can blind us to the fact that the people on the other team are often composed of good people who have something to say. And that is a take-home point from Hype that I'd go along with. It's good to interrogate ourselves to see whether we're showing too much of this kind of political manichaeanism. All of that is a good counterweight, a corrective to the worst tendencies in contemporary political debate. I'll end there. Thank you. It's a privilege to take part in today's conversation and hopefully it's time for questions. Term, mm. if you called it just simply defining the limits of when we are we and when we no longer are, you know, when we have yeah. But I'm not talking about what Simon was talking about. He was discussing these yes, superlative characteristics of being invulnerable, immortal, and, and, and radically independent from others, right? I must say, with all due respect to Simon, I don't really think the debates have been about that. Uh, the debates have tended to be about things like, can we you know, do experiments on things that are biologically human, you know, such as an eight-cell embryo? And what's at stake there is not these superlative values, it's whether, well, well, some people will think, well, because that is human biologically, it is somehow sacred and, and is inviolable. I think that is a different issue. There's another theory which I could have talked about today called the theory of background conditions, which says that every culture develops its concept of what's natural. And it uses that concept you know, as a set of conditions that cannot be violated you know, without causing great trouble and anxiety and, and so on. I think that does connect to the idea of sanctity. So often these ideas of the background conditions to human life that must not be violated are things to do with decisions at the beginning and end of life. They can, they can be other things as well. I mean, one background assumption might be that everyone must work for a living. You know, you, you, no one can free ride. But, but often, if you buy into that theory, it can explain why there's yeah, anxiety if we're talking about assisted reproduction. I mean, IVF caused terrible anxiety when it was first introduced. Reproductive cloning, when it was first introduced you know, with a sheep in 1996 and announced you know, in early 1997, caused terrible anxiety. As if something was being violated or something was being polluted. And, and we got all these kind of rationalisations that made no sense really when you look at them closely as to why this was a terrible thing. If you follow that debate back in 1997, Day after day, week after week, material was churned out by all sorts of people, whether it was politicians or, or you know, the Catholic Church or political leaders, rationalising what would be a terrible thing, a disaster, if we had reproductive human cloning. 
None of it added up. Uh, uh, yeah, the book Humanity Enhanced dissects a whole lot of these arguments in great detail. I think there was a sense there at a very emotional level that you know, something kind of sacred, if you want to call it that, is being violated when you talk about you know, bringing children to the world by you know, unnatural, so-called unnatural means. So that's, those are the kinds of ideas that I have in mind when we're talking about, about sanctity and you know, values that are so important that they must not be challenged or violated. And, and if you do violate them, you know, that's almost a demonic act that you've committed or, or a blasphemous act. Just, just okay. yeah, it seems to me that you're saying that we can not have any values which are fundamental, that everything's up for grabs. Uh, I don't think anything is of infinite value. All right, well, that's a particular, and I'm, I'm just questioning in what sense you actually need particular boundaries in order to thrive. Mm. I mean, utilitarians. I mean, they are, but, you know, if, if, you, if you have nothing that bounds you, then you have nothing to affect your decisions or your thinking. Yeah. So I mean, you, you, utilitarians, which I'm not really, but I suppose I can be a reasonable facsimile of one, uh, utilitarians have a relatively simple way of doing this. You know, to say what you aim for is you know, the greatest preference satisfaction in modern terms or you know, the greatest aggregate pleasure. You know, it, it, those kinds of answers can be given. I would give a much more pluralistic answer. I mean, I, I don't, when you get right down to it, believe in objective values at all, I have to confess. I'm a moral error theorist. So I can't believe in things like objective values. I, I, I think there are things we value I think we have emotional tendencies to value certain kinds of things. I think we're beings have to live together in societies, and we need to formulate rules to do that. But but yeah, you balance up a plurality of values. Well, Sorry, Tane. Uh, Bruce. Yeah, I look just a question or two about um, sanctity. Yeah. Um, the identity, the idea that uh, sanctity can be identified with infinite value is mm. a non-starter. Um, if you're a hedonistic utilitarian. Uh, and you, uh, you you add things up, you know, you, mm. mathematically. Yeah, so you generally be in a universe with an infinite um, infinite uh, number of people, each occur, you know, having a positive quality of life. Mm. Uh, you might well assign infinite value to that state of affairs, uh, but that wouldn't commit you to anything to do with sanctity, right? Um, it's, it's the wrong sort of infinite value that's over here. If you can make sense of it in those terms, sanctity is over there. Um, if you think of sanctity as being a non-natural property, I can see why you'd say, oh, we haven't really got any space, place for that, have we? But of course you needn't. Uh, you just think, we, you think it might, you might have some use for the concept of treating things with reverence and think that some things ought to be treated with reverence. Hmm. For example, if I, you know, if somebody uh, digs up the corpses of my parents and urinates on them, I might feel not only was this rather rude and uh, disrespectful, I might, you know, be appalled. Hmm. I might think, gee, you know, um, I think that my parents' bodies ought to be treated with, with reverence. Uh, this is an appalling violation, etc., etc. Now, would you be committed to the view that that is? irrational, because if you think that it's morally permissible, then we can find a way of giving sense that you could recognise about this talk of sanctity. Yeah, look, it's a very complex question. There are these things that cause us anxiety, cause us great anxiety, like you know, someone digging up the corpses of loved ones. And yeah, you could probably tell some sort of evolutionary story or whatever about why that might be so, sure. The fact is that I don't, I, I don't think that there's some objective value there. I think this is about human emotional tendencies. And I think if we started allowing people to do these things that you know, upset people so much, that will, will start to cause some kind of you know, social tensions and breakdowns. And, and so we have certain moral norms that we get by with. Uh, they do a job. But once we start extending that to more and more innovations, practices, symbols, we can eventually find that we have the kind of moral Manichaeanism where different tribes have different symbols, different things that they hold in reverence or see as pollutants 
And again, we're constantly at each other's throats. So fine. Culturally, we all are going to object to the digging up of the parents' corpses, etc. But when you get down to something like embryonic um, stem cell research, abortion rights, a whole lot of these other issues, and even things like genetic engineering, I believe a lot of these kinds of emotions come into play. And they are fundamentally irrational, at least. And they can stuff up public policy. They can have people at each other's throats unnecessarily, and they can hinder innovations that might actually be beneficial. So insofar as you are a moral non-realist, mm. uh, you're not going to buy sanctity because you think that it's a moral, moral sort of realist kind of notion. Uh, so that's a blanket thing, but then that would, that would, that would affect your attitude to morality in general. Um, and you're a bit, you think that maybe the concept of sanctity uh, is a difficult one to work with because it's so often extended to what in your view are inappropriate objects. But you're not prepared to downright dismiss somebody who thinks that certain things should be treated not only with respect but with reverence as utterly irrational. Look, at some level, maybe they are. Look, because I'm officially a moral error theorist, I'm going to say that there are pervasive mistakes going on in our moral language and the way people think about morality. But I'm not relying upon that today. It's just that once you start pressing me on what I fundamentally think about morality, I'm going to have to come clean and say, well, yes, I am actually a moral error theorist, and I think, well, yeah, we all want societies that, you know, that work, and we need to have moral codes that work, and there's no one true morality. Moral relativists are right about that, but if you're an extreme moral relativist who think that just any morality will do, well, that's wrong. And a good moral relativist like Jesse Prince and David Wong don't say that anyway. There's a lot of complicated metaethical things I could say I if you want to press me on metaethics. Just a little bit time, I Yeah, it's just a quick question. In some ways, it's along the same lines of what people have been asking you, but more specifically, thinking about Ronald Walken and his idea that often when people talk about the sacred, um, it masks a lot of underlying similarity and same in the case of abortion, where they're just talking about the intrinsic value of the fetus, and so there's a lot more agreement underneath if you just sort of get beyond uh, this term sacred. And uh, in some ways, that's, I think, what you've already been saying, but just curious enough to know what you Yeah. But I, but I do tend to worry when I see things like that because it, it, it does appear to me that some people really are regarding the embryo as in effect sacred. They are in effect putting an infinite value on it or seeing at least there being some kind of you know, binding you know, deontological rule that you not violate the embryo or something of that nature. Right? Yeah, I, I don't think it's good enough to say, well, we all give some moral worth to the embryo, but it's just that you can construe this in different ways, and as people like to walk and say, the government maybe shouldn't be making up their minds for us. I, I think that is actually a bit of a cop out if you go to the most fundamental metaethical levels. I, I would rather talk more like a utilitarian for the practical purposes. I'm going to have to play God at this point. <laughs> <laughs> there are a couple of questions waiting. You'll have to talk to the people later, I think, Russell. Though. Thank you, Russell.